Interpolation is an important topic in the displacement theory of finite elements. The reason is that we must interpolate the displacement field in the interior of the elements. Now this is somewhat a mathematical process, so some people will feel a little uncomfortable with this at first. But it actually is a straightforward topic. I'll start out by giving several simple rules about how polynomials work. Then we'll discuss what we need to know about interpolation in finite elements. There are two major approaches on interpolation in finite elements. One is the so-called displacement function, and the other is the shape function. So we'll discuss those in turn. And then we'll end up with a problem session. Let's take a general look at the idea of estimating functional values. What you might do is interpolation, which is our major interest, shown to the right here. And that involves estimating an interior functional value from information on the domain of interest. So you're looking inward toward the interior of the domain. On the other hand, extrapolation is where you would try to find a functional value exterior to a region where you have some information. And it turns out that interpolation is better because you are bounding your function. Extrapolation is a little bit more dangerous because you're projecting outward into an unknown region. Let's now concentrate on interpolation. And we'll follow some of the work of Hamming. Hamming says that there are four categories of interpolation. Those that only use functional values, and that would be similar to what I was implying in the previous figure. You could, in addition, have values of derivatives, which would be the slopes of this curve. You could sample perhaps nearby values of functions so that you could calculate slopes in an incremental way or a difference way. Or you could have arbitrarily placed sample points. Now this fourth category leads to Gauss integration and it means that you space the places where you sample the function in a very peculiar and special way in order to ensure accuracy. It turns out that's much more powerful than evenly spaced points. Now, people who are doing interpolation generally are doing these categories of work. Some people in experimental work fit experimental data with various curves. And I had an entire class on that, an entire course when I was in undergraduate school, a one-quarter course on experimentation and, and data fitting. If you know the degree of the polynomial, you might want to fit it exactly to a certain degree. But more generally, we don't know what the degree polynomial is. It's a higher degree polynomial, or maybe a transcendental function. And we'll use our method just to interpolate approximately. And that's pretty much the finite element approach. Now, the interpolation of an unknown curve, such as this red curve shown in this figure, is really closely related to the idea of integrating the area under the curve. And you can appreciate that because when you look at this sketch, you see that only the red curve is very complicated. The bounding straight line curves that bound the shaded area are easy. For this reason, people like Hamming will often discuss interpolation and numerical integration in the same chapter without any apology and without dis, you know, discriminating between the two concepts. At first, that was bothersome to me, but then it dawned on me, of course, this is the reason. Let's look at a couple examples of interpolation. In two dimensions on the left, you might have a quadrilateral with known values of a vector at the nodes, which are shown in red. Those would be your primary information for interpolation. If you were going to do a coldly mathematical interpolation, then you could find this 
field vector as a function of those nodal values directly, merely by a mathematical averaging process. If we take a minute, though, to think physically, the way we would probably do it in a homemade fashion would be to first concentrate on an edge and then estimate what would happen in terms of rotation and then shrinking and expansion of a vector as it progresses along that edge. If you did that for the four edges in turn, you would develop these blue vectors. At that point, you could make an intelligent guess as to the general swirling nature of this vector field and then infer what the field vector value would be at any given point. Likewise, in the three-dimensional example on the right, if we're given the red nodal values, we could again ultimately arrive physically at some insight as to what would be happening in the interior of the body. But our approach in the finite element work is rather to do the mathematical approach and try to directly find the field values in the interior of an element using only there are many important questions about the creation of solids, surfaces, and points from mathematical data. I find that many engineers in my classes have forgotten some of the ideas they learned back in high school algebra or calculus, and they've lost the feeling for how you pass lines through points and how you pass surfaces through points. That's logical to have forgotten because many times we don't apply that information in an important way to us. So many of us just took those as abstract ideas, it went ho-hum, and I'll probably never use that. But now let's walk through some of those concepts again and see if I can help some of you to recover some of that information. First of all, we're looking in a conventional three-dimensional space here. So I'm not interested in some crazy mathematics. It's just the normal space that we live in, a solid space, which is called a Euclidean space. So distances and measures are exactly what you think of when you get out your tape measure and measure something that you're making. In this space, if you take an arbitrary single algebraic equation and ask that that be true, then that equation will usually define a surface. There are some exceptional cases where you give an impossible task, such as x squared plus y squared equals minus 1, and that cannot be satisfied and will not give a real surface. If you specialize to a single linear equation, then you will always get the equation of a plane resulting because the general formula ax plus by plus cz equals a constant will always have an interpretation in a three-dimensional space as a plane. So single equations are the basic idea in a three-dimensional space and they effectively convert a three-dimensional space into a two-dimensional space if you think about that. You can use that equation to eliminate one of the variables in your underlying space. All right, the next step would be to consider what if you have two simultaneous equations that should be satisfied at the same time? Then, in fact, each of those will probably generate a surface. And if they intersect, you'll get a curve. So I have to hedge a little and say that maybe you'll get a curve because it's possible to cause two surfaces that are, let's say, spherical surfaces that lie disjoint and don't intersect. If you specialize again, though, to the linear case with two simultaneous linear equations, each of them defines the plane that we discussed earlier. And if those planes intersect, you'll now get a straight line. And the um, exceptional case would be if those planes were parallel so that you couldn't get such a straight line intersection. So again, I have to hedge a little bit. Notice here that two equations in a three-dimensional space have reduced the dimensionality down to one it, because you can parameterize a curve by a single coordinate, something like an arc length as it running, runs along its length. 
Well, finally we can ask what happens if we have three simultaneous equations and each of those would define a surface. If you're fortunate, those will intersect in a point. And I have to hedge again because they might, they might miss and you may not have a unique solution for that, a real solution. But again, if you specialize to linear equations, then you'll find that you have three planes that are always defined. And if they intersect, and that means that they're not parallel, then you'll get a point. So in this case, three equations have brought us from a three-dimensional space down to a point. Let me illustrate two of the cases shown in the previous figure. Here's a sketch where we have two simultaneous equations. One of them is linear and one nonlinear. And we find that there's a common intersecting line, which is a circle in this case. It's the penetration of a ogive type surface against a planar surface, with the intersecting line being the interesting curve that we have developed. The next relevant example is when you have three linear simultaneous equations in a three-dimensional space, and you get these three surfaces, which are planes, and they intersect at a point. So that shows then successively how we've gone from a three-dimensional space down to a one-dimensional space above here with two equations, and then down to a point when you have three equations. Now, the examples at the right here are to show what happens above when you have two disjoint curves and you find that you get no intersecting points. Here we have two intersecting curves where you do get some points. The last two sketches at the right of the previous figure were really planar situations or two-dimensional spaces, and they would be easier to discuss if we make special subcategories shown here. So if we restrict our um, space to two dimensions at the outset, then we can go through a similar process. Then one equation would lead to a curve, usually provided you didn't get the pathological case of some um, imaginary or complex curve that would result from such an equation x squared plus y squared equals minus 1, which we'd mentioned earlier. So, but you'll usually get a curve. And if you specialize to a linear equation, then you will always get a straight line in two dimensions. Notice that one equation in a two-dimensional space has dropped your dimensionality down to 1. So we seem to be losing a dimensionality in the space every time we add a simultaneous equation. We've seen going from a solid down to a surface, and then to a curve, and then to a point. Now in two dimensions, we're progressing from a flat space to a curve with one equation. Now, if you have two simultaneous equations, that will bring you down to a point in two dimensions, with the exception being if those um, simultaneous equations didn't have an intersection point of the relevant curves that, that they each develop. And that was an example we showed on the previous figure. Now, if you go to two simultaneous linear equations, then you're usually going to get a point unless those lines are parallel. Okay, finally, let's go down to a one-dimensional or a linear space where we have typically line elements. In this case, if you give one equation, you're just saying something like x equals 1. Well, that will give you a point. The only exception would be if you gave some kind of a crazy thing like x squared equals minus 1, and which would then fail to give a real point. But if you specialize to a linear equation, you always get a point. So I think we can conclude there is some 
there's some form and some structure, some mathematical structure to this business of specifying equations and how it reduces the dimensionality of the space in which you are embedded. Now we've just considered what happens when you apply simultaneous equations to a given space and how it reduces the dimensionality of the space to do that. It turns out that in finite elements, particularly for developing shape functions later, we want to do the opposite process. We have information of what's happening on points and lines and we want to build up and develop surfaces. I consider this to be a trick in a way, and it depends on the concepts we just had. But let's think along those lines. Suppose you are embedded in the x, y plane. Then if you write one equation such as this, we know that that would usually generate a curve. Now the trick is, knowing this red curve, can we now generate a surface that passes through that curve. Well, you can. You can do the trick of writing the third coordinate z to be a constant times this function. Now, you don't set the function zero because it's only zero on that particular red curve. Now think of the three-dimensional space that we're embedded in, and we realize we've written one equation in three dimensions. That should reduce the dimensionality down to a surface, which it does, and it would create this green crosshatched surface here, which incidentally passes through the red curve. You can repeat this process for two given curves here. Let's call the relevant functions f1 and f2. Now if you form an equation z, which is the third coordinate, as a constant times the function f1 and the fun function f2, you'll get this green crosshatch surface resulting again, and it passes through both curves. This is going to be very useful in developing shape functions. An important theorem for us is the fundamental theorem of algebra. This is the one that says that a real polynomial of degree n will have exactly n roots. And roots means points on the real axis where the function goes to zero. Now you have to count repeated roots and you have to count complex roots. So I state the theorem here and then I give a typical nth degree polynomial. If it were a quadratic, which would only be the first three terms, you know that such a parabola could either cross the x-axis, giving two real roots, shown here, or it could just touch the x-axis and have a repeated root, shown here, or it might not extend far enough downward to intersect the real axis. Then you have complex roots. In much of what we do, we're going to be interested in this first case, where we will get exactly n zero crossings for a polynomial of degree n. To keep track of polynomial terms in two and three dimensions requires a crutch for bookkeeping. This is called Pascal's triangle in two dimensions. And if your polynomial has a series of terms and perhaps a partial set of these down to some level, let's say, uh, I've drawn a line that would separate the complete cubic from the rest of the terms. And then you can arrange these in a symmetric display which shows the emphasis of your polynomial on the x and the y coordinates. We would like in our work typically to equally emphasize x and y. And so when we choose polynomials here in two dimensions, we would be obliged to keep some symmetry about the vertical central axis. And that's done. People will choose certain clusters of terms to represent their situation. Some of them look like a Christmas tree when you start putting uh, higher order terms below. They look like they have a trunk and then a pointed top. 
It would be called geometric isotropy if you do satisfy this law of equally emphasizing the x in the y direction. And that's physically important in, inter in interpolation because you do not know the orientation of a typical element a priori. It might lie in any direction. So you can't favor a given coordinate. When interpolating in three dimensions using polynomials, we need a little different crutch. Here I show a tetrahedron which would have the elements arrayed in a similar manner as the Pascal triangle along each face. And then if you take a horizontal cut, such as this red triangle, you would intercept such terms as shown here. And again, if you wanted a complete polynomial to a certain degree, you would carry this level plus all terms above it to the point. Now let's turn our attention to interpolation in the finite element method. There are three ways that you can enter the problem by assuming strains, which Turner did, and which is not possible in most situations, but then more generally by assuming a displacement function or by assuming a shape function. So of the various mappings involved in the process shown in my flowchart here, I've put in red those matrices and vector that might be the original assumption in the problem that captures the geometric flavor of the problem. Now, in every case, you want to go from nodal displacements all the way mapping over to nodal forces. So that's common. And then the details of where you start make a distinction between the methods. Actually, it's the shape function approach that is the more modern way to do the displacement method in finite elements. Shape functions are indeed the major tool for finite element interpolation. But let's first look at the displacement function, which was the older fashioned approach and which does have some physical interpretation included. The displacement function merely means that you expand a function of some coordinate in terms of that coordinate in various polynomial degrees with generalized coordinates that are the coefficients q1, q2, on up to, in this case, q4. If you go into two underlying dimensions, then you'll have a function, perhaps, of uh, both x and y appearing, and here's an xy term. This particular expression is geometrically isotropic because it treats x and y equally, including both of them in this fourth term. Then if we go to uh, vector functions of two variables, and this could be the displacement field in a plane stress element, let's say, then you can write it out in this manner. This seems to couple the generalized coordinate with the underlying independent coordinates here, and it's sometimes better to write this out in matrix form, which I'll show in the next figure. I'll factor the generalized coordinates out to the right so it emphasizes their role as variables. That's here. And then we cluster the terms using x and y coordinates within this matrix, which we call the displacement function matrix. The physical insight comes from the fact that when you post multiply by this vector of generalized coordinates, such as Q1, that they will multiply column by column the appropriate part of the displacement function. So for instance, Q1, the first generalized coordinate, causes a displacement field of a unit value in the x direction and zero value in the y. That means the entire body moves with a rigid body motion one unit to the right. So this is a so-called rigid body mode. And you can see that directly from the displacement function. Likewise, Q4 multiplies a column that is a rigid body mode in the y direction. If you sort through these terms, then sometimes you can analyze which are straining modes and which are rigid body modes. Then finally, rewriting in a compact matrix notation, we see that phi plays the role of mapping from the generalized coordinates to the internal displacement field. 
Now there are three goals here. We'd like to have geometric isotropy in every case. We would prefer to have complete polynomials, but it's okay if they're not. Many finite elements are created where you have uh, incomplete polynomials, but they're evenly distributed between the x and the y terms, so they're still isotropic. Lastly, it would be nice if you had exact interpolation in this process, but usually we're happy only to have an approximation. Now we come to the heart of our lecture, which is a discussion of shape functions. First we'll start with one-dimensional shape functions, and then later we'll do two-dimensional. And even within those categories, you have subcategories of linear or quadratic and cubic and higher interpolation. So make sure you understand which subcategory that we're discussing. Here we start with one-dimensional shape functions, and that means a function defined uh, as a function of a variable x. And I'll start out with linear interpolation in one dimension, which is the very simplest kind. Linear interpolation is common to people who have taken tabular values and then interpolated to find missing interior values. For instance, suppose you were a poor, struggling student and your trig function table only gives values every 10 degrees, and you need the value of sine of 24 degrees. How do you do that? Well, it's very intuitive by ratio and proportion. It really depends on similar triangles, which in turn really depends on a linear approximation to the slope going through these points. Now, 24 degrees is bounded by values at 20 and 30, and so we make use of those. A typical way is to position your attention to the 20 degree point and say that at 24 degrees, you're going to take the value at 20, which is something like an elevation. Then you're going to take 40% of the elevation difference between 20 and 30 degrees because you want to evaluate 40% along the horizontal direction, and therefore you feel you will achieve 40% of this difference in elevations. And I think almost every engineer can handle this kind of an equation. In fact, this is the way you think when you mark, if you march along a mountain path and you understand where you are, plus if you look ahead at the mountain, you'll see how much more you have to climb. So it's a very intuitive approach. Now, hang on to your hat because a lot of people don't survive the next step. What you want to do merely is reevaluate the way we're doing this and gather the terms in a different way. If we notice in here, the functional value for 20 degrees appears twice. A simpler way is to combine those two values, those two samples, and add their coefficients, which add up only to 6 tenths. Then you take the evaluation at 30 degrees, which has the 40% on it. And what you now have is truly interpolation, and that is that the value at an intermediate point is found by weighting the value at the left by a certain weight constant, weighting the value at the right by a certain amount. That's somewhat philosophically like centering yourself at 24 degrees, which is between those two points, and then looking in both directions at the end points. In other words, reaching out with your arms in both directions, touching what's happening in the neighborhood, and then making an averaged calculation to see what the functional value is at your location. Many engineers have a hard time with this concept, but I notice that mathematicians and um, uh, people who are trained more in uh, computer science and math have an easier time. I'd like to go into more detail about the process that we've just completed. Here's a sketch repeating those important points, the 20 degree point, the 30 degree point, and then our 24 degree position where we wish to find this starred quantity. The distances involved turned out to be 40% uh, from the left end and 60% from the right end. Interestingly, though, the coefficients were multiplied in the inverse way, such that the 0.6 multiplied the 
trial value over here and the 0.4 multiplied the trial value here. So there's some kind of an inverse action happening here. So let's generalize that process and rather than thinking of a point that's only 40% of the way from one boundary to the other, let's let that be a variable. So now I'm going to call that position x and x will be intermediate to the left end at x1 and the right end at x2. Then we find that the fractional distance from the ends can be related by the quantity x, x minus x1 over the total distance and x minus x2 over the total distance. Um, if we then, remembering that that was a, an inverse law, put the coefficients on the sample value of the functions in the inverse way, we then end up with these red coefficients in front, these uh, rational polynomials. And those are exactly what we call shape functions, n1 and n2. Those are now functions of x, and they tell you how you emphasize your trial value at the left boundary and at the right boundary. We will expand further on those shape functions in the next figure. Now I want to show you how the process works when you use shape functions to interpolate a function. In this first sketch on the left, I have a domain line between x1 and x2. The shape functions are defined on that domain and they have a unit value at what I call the home node and a zero value at the other node or nodes. So the n1 shape function goes linearly from 1 to 0. Likewise with the shape function n2 which has a unit value here at the right end at its home node. Now how is that used to interpolate? Well you look at the figure on the right and you see that there might be some unknown function f of x up here. You do not know what that function is, but are allowed to sample it at those two points, x1 and x2. In so doing, you would come here on the shape function description and pick out the values of the shape functions that are relevant there, and then multiply them times the samples at the two extremes of your region in this case, and that would lead to a certain estimation of the function. If you varied that position x and did this successively for a number of points, you would indeed track this linear function f of x at the top and fill in this function uniformly. Now the contribution of each of the shape functions is shown in the shaded areas where the shape function n1 multiplied by the functional value at the left boundary will contribute the red shaded area to the total functional value at the top. Likewise, the shape function n2 multiplied times the functional value at the right end will contribute the blue crosshatched area and subsequently contribute to the function at the top. So this is linear interpolation. You may need to think about it a little bit. It's a very powerful idea, and it really is uh, pretty much a generalization of the idea of the lookup routine for interpolating trig functions or sine functions. Let's now consider quadratic interpolation. This will require the use of parabolas for shape functions. The general formula will involve three terms in that we'll have three shape functions, n1, n2, and n3, multiplied times the function evaluated at three points, which will be nodes for us. The shape functions can be chosen to give a unit value at a home node and then zero value at two other nodes. We know that from the fundamental theorem of algebra that says that a secondary polynomial does have two zero crossings. So it's just a matter of some curve fitting to form these three shape functions shown here on the left. And one takes a unit value at the left node and then zero values at the other nodes and so on. 
when we move to the process then, shown at the right, we are interested in interpolating this function f of x shown in a dashed line because we don't know exactly where that is. We are able to sample it, however, at the three points shown at x1, at x2, and then x3. And of course, the idea is to approximate that function in all interior regions. Well, the contribution of each of the shape functions is shown in the cross-hatching. The left sample value multiplied by n1 gives you the red cross-hatched area. The second shape function multiplied by the evaluation of the function at that midpoint gives you the blue cross-hatched area. And then the third shape function gives you the green cross-hatched area. Notice that there are some negative regions here, such that the sample value will actually be used to subtract from an estimated function in certain regions. That's a little bit of a teeter-totter effect where when you're away from a sample value, you might actually be moving in the opposite direction. In the previous figures, I have sketched some shape functions but haven't shown really how to calculate them. So now we have to develop some ways to actually uh, form these shape functions. You can do this in two ways. You can either do it by a summation approach or by a product approach. And if you can, the product form is usually easier. This actually is in the same line as factorizing a polynomial. And if you know what the roots are, then it's pretty easy to find the form by factors of those um, terms minus the location of the root. That'll show up in a few minutes. Let's start out with the simpler brute force approach called the summation method. And suppose you had the three noted rod here and propose to develop some shape functions. Okay, we'll call them n1 of x. We know they have to have a unit value at the home node and then zero values elsewhere. We know that we can do that. It's just a matter of evaluating those three coefficients, a, b, and c. To find the coefficients for a quadratic shape function, you need those three conditions, namely that there's a unit value at the home node and zero values at the other nodes. So that gives us these three algebraic equations. And then when you substitute in the general quadratic form, you get three equations in the three unknowns, A, B, and C. So you can see that that can be done. I call it a brute force method because as you get to larger and larger problem sizes, for instance, a solid element with 20 nodes, then you might have to solve 20 equations in 20 unknowns symbolically. And that's not easy, although in the future with um, symbolic mathematical packages, maybe people will do more of it. Nevertheless, the summation form is a good candidate and, and can be used on small problems. The most popular method right now for finding shape functions is the product form. Sometimes people are able to guess uh, functional forms and, and put them in a product. Certainly in one dimension it's easy when you know the zero crossings. So you build into the function the so-called product or factored form of the polynomial. You leave a constant out front to adjust for the um, functional elevation of 1 at the home node. So in other words, the zeros are automatically built in, and then we uh, just adjust the scale in order to get the unit value. This gives us really only one equation and one unknown, namely that you set the shape function to be unity, in this case at 0, and evaluate the constant c and directly leading to a shape function. I know that it may not seem any easier in one dimension and with three nodes, but when you get into two and three dimensions with many nodes, then the product form becomes easier. It has led to an approach called a serendipity shape functions, where people are able to guess this factorized form and able to make these shape function surfaces pass through zero um, over all the required points. 
let's now talk about shape functions in two dimensions. And we'll use the triangle as a candidate problem. Here I show a constant strain triangle described by three nodes lying in the xy plane. Now we're able to write down the equations of the lines that bound the triangle. Of course, we have a body that is restricted to lie in the xy plane, and one equation then will create a line. And it's a linear equation, so it's a straight line. Now, what we'd like to do is solve for the shape functions by uh, the conditions we've outlined. Namely, that the first shape function should have a unit value at the origin and then zero values out at these remote nodes. One way to do that would be to use a linear surface that would pass not just through those two nodes, but would, would have a zero crossing line all along that far line shown here. Now we studied earlier how you could progress from the equation of a line in two dimensions and turn that into a surface in three dimensions. And what you do is take the third dimension, which for us is the shape function itself as a function of x and y, to be some constant times a function of x and y. That function of x and y for us is the basically the equation of the far side. And when we join that up, we get indeed the equation for the shape function. Then we just need to evaluate the coefficient c to make it have unit value at the origin. I'll sketch the shape functions as they would appear over the triangle. Here's our first shape function viewed from above as the crosshatch blue surface. And to evaluate it, we look at the value at the origin, putting zero values in for x and y. And we find that the constant c is just 1 over b. And directly put that in as the constant here. And then we see we can put it in the following form, which is shows the non-dimensional characteristics that it's 1 minus x over a minus y over b. Kind of a nice form for that shape. The other two functions are actually easier because, for instance, for the shape function n2 should have a unit value over the um, point out here. And then the equation of this line is just x equals 0. So you form the, by the trick that we discussed earlier, you take a constant times that function, which is x, and set that to be your third coordinate, the vertical coordinate, which we call n2. And then we evaluate the coefficient c out at the point, um, it would be a and 0, which I show here. And that just equals CA. So you get the value of C rather quickly and then the non-dimensional shape function. The third shape function for the triangle is also simple. Let's look at this function, which is a planar surface, cross-hatched in blue. It has to pass through the x-axis here whose equation is y equals 0 in two dimensions. Then we build up our three-dimensional surface, which is a plane, by taking that function y, multiplying by an arbitrary constant c, evaluate the constant out at the third node, and arrive at this shape function. Now let's turn to a little more complicated problem, namely an eight-noted quadrilateral shown here. This has eight nodes, and therefore a given shape function will have eight conditions. Seven that it pass through zeros at the other nodes, and then a condition that it must have a unit value at the eighth node. If you think of this in the displacement function approach, then you know that you need eight generalized coordinates. It will turn out that this will require a cubic polynomial, but an incomplete one. 
if you think of the product form, we're going to also arrive at that cubic answer in a different way. For instance, if you concentrate on the upper left node and the shape function for it, if you could pass planes through a line passing here through those two nodes, another plane through these three nodes, and a last plane through these three nodes, then the product of those three functions would give you a cubic again as before. Likewise, we could look at a mid-side node such as the one on the left side here and this time we could take the product of surfaces, namely planes that pass through the upper and lower edges as well as the right edge and again we would get a cubic. So we really have enough ability now to calculate shape functions for rather complicated bodies using the product form. I'm not going to go further on that though because I don't want to develop a whole stockpile of shape functions before we are motivated for their use. So I think it's better to develop those as we need. It's time for a problem session now. Problem one is a plane strain triangle and we're asked to find one of the shape functions. Here's our triangle and it has the conventional corner nodes but in addition has mid-side nodes 2, 4, and 6. The included angle is 45 degrees and this is a right triangle. Let's make some general observations in our solution. First of all, the plane strain problem has 2 degrees of freedom per node. Secondly, when you're interpolating for the U displacement and the V displacement in this problem, you can use the same shape functions for each. So the N4 shape function will actually help you interpolate both the U and the V displacement over the face of the element. Now because there are six nodes and we're going to need to have zeros at five other locations, we would expect then to have a polynomial with some six terms because you're going to need the five, you're going to use five coefficients to pass through zeros and a sixth one to adjust the constant. So this shape function N4, if we consider it in a additive form like this, would have those six constants so that we can meet six conditions. We're actually going to find our shape function from a product form, however. And N4 being the shape function that's uh, based on this home node number four, then could be satisfied by being formed from a surface from the product of surfaces going through the red line here and the blue line over here. So we're going to use that product form again with a undetermined coefficient c and then the first function of x and y and the second function. That will satisfy all of the five zeros and then by adjusting the constant c we can get the unit value. Now that's the first task we're going to do here is to evaluate at the home node which is on this point which has x coordinate of a and y coordinate of a over 2. So we put those values in, evaluate the two functions, set it to be 1, solve for the constant, and then that yields our 